Well, I trust that Pastor Elliot took good care of you last weekend when I was gone. He uh, motivated your prayer life, I trust, from that sermon in Colossians chapter 4. And his generosity and sacrifice in coming to preach here allowed me to go and preach at a conference they had postponed from last year out in Tennessee and was able to preach five times there, uh, representing our church and you and God's Word. So I'm um, happy to report now that I'm back that it went well. Uh, it, it doesn't always go well, just so you know, when I'm gone preaching elsewhere. Uh, like the time I was preaching at an executive, Christian executives conference, they asked me, and it wasn't five times, I just had one slot in this conference, and um, it happened to be at the Ritz-Carlton of all places, uh, which I'm not used to going to. It was kind of a frou-frou, highfalutin, you know, Pastor Mike, find your tie and put it on kind of event. And so I, um, I went there, and like places like the Ritz-Carlton, you, there was no self-parking. So you kind of get shooed into the line for the valet, which I wasn't really prepared for. And um, whatever, they're good at it. They greet you, they open the door, and I felt kind of shooed out of my own car, a little bit flustered. But I, I grabbed my Bible, I grabbed my, uh, my notes folder for the sermon, and I, I grabbed it all and, and straightened my, the knot on my tie and, and walked through the entrance of the Ritz-Carlton. Went down, figured out where it was, saw the signs, went down into the ballroom. And in the ballroom, they um, you know, immediately met me. I meet, met some you know, luminaries and um, did a little chit-chat. That was nerve-wracking enough. And then they took me to the very front row where they had the, the speaker participants of the conference up there. So I sat there waiting my turn and um, they sang some worship songs. And uh, we were a couple worship songs in, in this conference. And uh, my handler leans over and says, okay, you'll, you'll be up. Uh, right after this, so this song. So I'm, uh, you know, the whole time trying not to to peek at my notes because I don't want to give anyone the impression I'm not prepared for this. Uh, but when he said that, I couldn't help. I was already a little nervous about this crowd. I mean, people I'd seen around the country on TV, and there they were. And I, I, so I had to kind of sneak a peek at my notes. And so I cracked open my little leather covered, you know, note folder and uh, opened it up, and uh, there it was. Nothing. Uh, I didn't have any notes in the folder. You might think this is a nightmare that I'm just reciting to you, but this happened in real life. It is the recurring nightmare of pastors. Uh, you know, we wake up in a cold sweat, like in a crowd somewhere, and then they hand us a microphone. It's like, go, and, and we're not ready. We're not prepared. And the, there is really no worse feeling than uh, the, the, the spotlight and the, and the microphone and like someone putting you up on a platform and, and having, you're supposed to be saying something important at this point and not having, you know, not being ready. That is the, the most horrible feeling. You better go to those situations prepared. We've been studying Acts chapter 10, and it's been a lot to get to the punchline. We've reached the zenith of the text where we're going to have Peter share the gospel with Cornelius. And um, so much of this text, right, with 39, uh, 29 verses preceding where we're at today, was all about preparation. It's all about the prep that God was doing to get Peter ready uh, to do this and getting Cornelius ready to, to have this encounter. Now, I know this was uh, a monumental encounter, and this is one of the reasons we explained last time why it took so long to get here, because this is a uh, you know, Jewish apostle sharing the gospel with a uh, Roman centurion and talk about the ends of the earth. What a monumental layer to break that the gospel was going to this representative, very uh, powerful representative of the Gentile you know, nation. This is all about Gentile inclusion. And so Peter needed to be ready. And um, I, I can sympathize that while we are not engaged in probably a conversation about Christ this week with someone that's on the magnitude of Gentile inclusion right, in the book of Acts, um, every encounter you have with a non-Christian about uh, the gospel feels monumental, does it not? I mean, that's when your heart starts to beat a little bit more, when the conversation turns to, to religion or the Bible, or the afterlife and Christ, and you know this is a go time. I got to talk about uh, the things we learn about in church, the things I read in my Bible, I, it's time for me to talk right now. And uh, there's noth nothing worse than when the topic comes up and you are like, it's like your turn to talk and, uh, and not being prepared. I mean, it's that, it's that horrible feeling. And, and so I want us to get in the sandals of Peter after all this preparation as we reach like the climax of this passage where here he's going to share the gospel uh, to say, I, I want to make sure I'm as prepared as, as Peter was. So I know the setting is different, the environment is different, the, the, the focus of our 
you know, uh, evangelistic concerns are, are somewhat different, but sharing the gospel is that, that sweaty palm, nervous need kind of discussion that all of us need to make sure we're thoroughly prepared for. So uh, I'm going to try to get through, if we can, verses 30 through 48 here in Acts chapter 10. And because we're a Bible church, I want you to open up your Bibles, whether it's electronic or printed on the page, and look at these verses with me. And let's just go through this a section at a time and, and try to, to get ourselves as prepared as we can be. Because you do not want to be in a conversation on Tuesday afternoon when you know the gospel conversation is teed up and you're the one that's supposed to kick this through the field goal and in the goalpost, and you, you're not ready. Uh, you need to get ready. Church is about being equipped and prepared. So Christian, uh, I want to get you ready for the next conversation about Christ with a non-Christian as best we can from this text. So let's start in verse 30 as we're picked up in the middle of this scene. We've got Cornelius now under the same roof of Peter because Peter has been brought to Caesarea uh, where all these Romans are running around in Caesarea Maritime where the Roman... Uh, uh, soldiers are stationed, and um, it, it's, it's go time. It's time to talk about the gospel. But first, in verse 30, Cornelius is going to set it up with, hey, I've been prepared for this conversation, right? Four days ago, look at it, verse 30. Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying at my house in the ninth hour, at three in the afternoon, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And that, obviously, we know from the beginning of this chapter, we're talking about an angelic being here. So God sends this, this supernatural, angelic being. He's there like a person in bright clothing. And he says, Cornelius, right, your prayers have been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send, therefore, to Joppa. Right, get, get a contingent up there or down there to Joppa, down the Mediterranean coast, and ask for Simon, right, who is called Peter. He's lodging the house of Simon, a tanner, by the sea. So I sent for you at once. This is Cornelius saying this to Peter now that he's finally under his roof. And you've been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you've been commanded by the Lord. Now, this is where if you're reading in your actual Bibles, you have the, uh, the, the subject heading here in a new, new paragraph because that was like when he was describing how he'd been prepped. But I want to, in this first point, include verses 34 and 35 because this is Peter, and I want to be in Peter's sandals this morning. He is seeing and recognizing uh, that he's been prepared. And of course, he'd been prepared to deal with the gospel conversation with someone who had been prepared. And he says this, verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and he said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now that's the section here, those six verses of my first observation this morning, and I trust it will be a very brief observation, because I want you to see that the division in our logic starts in verse 36, where now he's going to start to say what he's asking for, right? You're asking in verse number 33, right? I want to hear all that you've been commanded by the Lord. Now, verse 36, as for the word that he sent to Israel, and then he's going to explain the elements of the gospel. And it's a summary discussion, right? This is not a transcription of what he said, but a summary, a divinely orchestrated, God breathed, God had, had driven Luke to write these things down as a synopsis of what the gospel discussion was all about. Before we get there, I just want to look at verses 34 and 35. Peter is saying, I, I know you're the right person to share the gospel with here. I know God has been working on you and has prepared you. Now, if I say, hey, you Christians should be evangelical, go out and share the gospel. It's not like every single person you meet, you're like, oh, don't talk about Christ, 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 Christ. And, and you know that how this works in real life is God is directing and moving, Acts 17, people into places where you're going to have a conversation and you even know it in the moment. Like this is the conversation that should be turned to biblical, spiritual things. And that's because you've got to look for the person that is prepared. You have to detect the fact Right? in one way or another, that God has prepped this person for this conversation. Not that there's not a thing such as cold contact evangelism. There is, surely. But the reality is real good gospel conversations, and I've done a lot of cold contact evangelism, but the, the conversations where God is, is working, it's like we get this sense with a coworker, a neighbor, some parent on my kid's soccer team. There's this sense in which, okay, this person is ripe, so to speak. He's ready to have a conversation about spiritual things. 
So let's make this observation for our first point, make it as quick as we can. Number one, we need to detect God's pre-conversion work. If you're taking notes, that's what we need. Your preparation involves you being prepared enough to say, I think this is the right conversation with this person. And, and, and the way we do that, if you want to go back in your thinking, is to the beginning of this, this chapter study, which was three, three, four weeks ago, when we looked at the first section in Acts 10, where we described something that got a little mushy in people's minds, this theological discussion of this pre-conversion grace. We talked about natural revelation, special revelation. We talked about the fact that God has, has this general grace, this common grace it's often called, right, that keeps the sun shining on the fields of people and it keeps them digesting their food and oxygenating their blood. And God is giving all these people. He feeds the animals. He feeds the people. He keeps everybody going. But then there's a kind of grace, a kind of favor, a kind of unearned work that God does in bringing people to himself. And those moves of God in the circumstances and hearts of those people is not salvation, but it's preparatory for them being saved, for them responding rightly to the gospel. This is pre-conversion grace. This is God's work of preparing them to hear this. We quoted John 6, 44. We talked about the fact that no one's going to come to Christ unless the Father first draws him. There's this pre-conversion work that God is doing. Now, even as I say that, it's just undeniable that obviously Cornelius, and we looked at several things at the beginning of this chapter, was doing in Cornelius' heart to make him a key candidate for this discussion as the first named Gentile in the book of Acts to be, to be saved. And, and, and that picture, right, when he is there as this key uh, convert, it's like, yeah, God has been working in his life. And all I want to do is have you think, even now, would you think sitting here in church with air conditioning and, and padding under your rear end to say, okay, are there people in my sphere of influence that, that I can see, I can detect, I can sense God is, is working on them? If you want to take it from another angle, think about how Jesus talked about the Spirit being sent into the world to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Right? Remember that verse? The Spirit is going out. That's not their conversion, but it gets their ears open and their eyes open then to see Christ and to hear the gospel. That is the preparatory work. And some of you, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, you think you became a Christian when you started feeling conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit, or you started to get something out of the scriptures, and, and the church made sense to you, or the Bible made sense. I must have become a Christian then. No, 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 that's pre-conversion work. You're not a Christian until you respond rightly to the gospel in repentance and faith. But that pre-conversion work, now that we're Christians, if you are a Christian here this morning, sharing with non-Christians, we've got to be able to detect that. And I'm not saying you don't get into some conversations and, and, and test this out and, and they, it makes it clear that in their response, I'm not even interested in talking about these things. But you know people that you sense maybe they've gone through something, you think they really are feeling something more than the average non-Christian's conscience here. It seems like they're under some kind of conviction. Or even like Paul, they're kicking hard against Christ and it seems, like, it seems kind of odd there, the way that Christianity has become this target of their, their vitriolic comments and, and yet they seem to be searching for the meaning and something eternal and God is working in their hearts. Or maybe they're just coming to church regularly, but they're really not a Christian, but you know they're, they're kind of in it and they're willingly packing up and, 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 and showering, putting on deodorant and coming to church. It's like, wow, you know, what's motive? God's doing something, but they're not a Christian yet. And I just need you to think about that and detect that. And I don't have time to explore that further, but I would suggest if you weren't here at the beginning of our study of Acts chapter 10, that you go back there and think of all the ways in which God's pre-conversion grace, right, that, that, that grace that, that reaches and starts dragging people in, that you look for that. And that becomes the thing that, that you say, okay, now I'm going in with the gospel. It's like having fish, right, uh, being, uh, being taken downstream, Right? And the Bible says we're dead in our transgressions and sin. No one seeks after God. No one swims upstream. Right? And, and, and they don't. And you're supposed to be there on the shores with this little net and you're, you're catching people for Christ. Yeah, well, God has to send his spirit out first and hook this dead fish and start dragging them upstream. And, and that's what happens. Right? No, one comes to Father unless, no one comes to Christ unless the Father first draws him. There's all of this work of God drawing them. Well, now when I'm seeing this this dead fish. This is a terrible illustration. Um, but you're kind of moving in the wrong. It's like, how, why is that non-Christian seeking God? Right? Because God is enabling that. Right? We know that no one seeks God. Romans chapter 3, this was the whole premise of that sermon. But God's dragging them in this direction, dragging them toward us, 
I, I'm going to reach in now, and, and I need to have that conversation. Okay, that's a modern application of this ancient work of what God had done miraculously through this angelic visitation, and I just want to say I want to have eyes to, to see those that are starting to have eyes to see the gospel. Right? I want to be able to listen to conversations and have ears to hear that someone is starting to have ears so that they might hear the gospel. If, by the way, it bothers you that, that, that Peter says, hey, I understand that, that, that God shows no partiality in every nation. Anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable. Well, then good, why do I need to convert him? Right? If you start quoting this passage as some foolishly do, to say, well, then the Buddhist can stay the Buddhist, and the Hindu can stay the Hindu, and the Muslim can stay the Muslim. Well, why do we need to convert anybody? That's so non-21st you know, century. Uh, listen, um, the whole reason this statement is made is because now this person, right? it's much like Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2, the, the idea of it, you've got to believe that God is, is this God who is, and he's a rewarder of those who seek him. That There's a sense in which, okay, now I'm, I, I'm ready. I'm seeing the value in this. In, in other words... Right? They now have ears. That's a gift of God, the grace of God. Right? And, and those ears now that have been given to them, now they need to hear the gospel. The whole point is Peter is being sent here to this guy that God has placed his favor on, pre-conversion favor, that he might get him the gospel. If it didn't matter, let him just live in Rome and do his thing and come visit Israel and Caesarea and go home. It doesn't matter because you fear God and you, you, know, you, you do the right stuff. You, you, you seem to, to, to be praying and ah, you're good. You don't need Christ. That's not the point. You need Christ. That's what this whole passage is about. So let's talk about that. You need to be ready as he is. Let's now read verses 36 and following with a message of the gospel. He's going to give this word, which is sent to Israel, right? Because he's a Jewish apostle and it's all about the preaching of good news, right? That's U angelion, that's the word, U angelion, U is good, angelion, angelos, angels, not baseball, this is messengers, angelos is, is, is a messenger, uh, this, this message, right, which is what this is all about, the good message, we call it the good news, we call it, here's the English word, old English word for it, the gospel, the good news, we've got a message of good news, so are you ready with this message that God sent first to Israel, and now you're a Gentile, you're like, a, a, a the progeny of, of, of uh, Cornelius. Now you're, you know, this, this, this Gentile that's got the message. To, do, you, do you have it? Do you understand it? Do you know it? Are you ready to, to share it? Number two, let's start with that. Be ready to share God's gospel message. And then look at the scary subpoints under this, this on, on the, do you got a worksheet? Crazy, crazy. I heard rumor last night went really long. Okay, well, you can't believe those people that come to Saturday night service. You never know what they're going to say about my preaching. So just don't believe any of that. But do believe that we got a lot to cover right here in point two. Ready? Okay, interactive nine o'clock crowd. We're ready. Look at this. Verse 36. Okay, you ready? What kind of message is this? It's the preaching of good news. Here's two words. I don't, I, I, I mean, I was going to say I don't want to make too much of it, but I've got to make a lot of it, right? Of peace, of peace through Jesus Christ, right? He, he's Lord of all. What is this message? Just the tenor of the message, the feeling of the message, the sense of the message, the theme of the message, the subject of the message. When someone finally wants to talk to me about spiritual things, and I'm, I've done whatever diagnostic conversation, and I feel like this person, we need to talk about Christianity. We need to talk about the gospel, right? What kind of message am I giving them, right? It says it's a message of peace. Okay, now you're tempted because he's a Gentile, and, and Peter's a, a Jew that we might be talking about kind of all getting along because it even ends with this phrase, he is Lord of all. But that would be a complete misunderstanding of the word peace. In other words, Christianity is not sent to you so that you can have better relationships with everyone. Matter of fact, Jesus asked the question, if we're talking merely of horizontal connections with other people, he said, don't think that I came to earth to bring peace. I didn't come to earth to bring peace. He said, I came to bring division. And I'll set a man right against members of his own household. I'll, I'll set a father against his son and, and, and wife against his daughters. And, and it, this, the house is going to be divided because of me. What about that passage in, in, the, in, the, in the Christmas card? I mean, and that's in the Bible somewhere, right? Yeah, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Okay, well, number one, go look at it in your Bible. That's not what it says, right? It, it, it's peace, right, among those with whom he is pleased. So God is going to grant peace to the people on whom his favor sets. And that group is going to be an embattled group of people with all the people that reject the, the king, the Lord of all. Right? The people right now, just go write someone in some university professorial office or some, you know, I don't know, some, some 
you know, news anchor on some cable channel and say, is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus the king of your life? Right? Well, of course not. No, that's going to divide us. So what kind of peace are we talking about? Right? We're talking about a peace that the whole gospel is predicated on, and that is the fact that you have a sin problem. You're alienated from God. Your sins have made a separation between you and your God, to quote Isaiah 59.2, and that hostility needs to be reconciled. Right? There's enmity between you and your creator. You and God are not okay. Cornelius, right? God's favor is rested upon you. You have now ears to hear. God's pre-saving grace is, is active in your life, but you're not right with God. You need peace with God, right? That's a good way to put it. Or the way I put it in a little book I wrote on the gospel is you need to get right with God because we're not born right with God. So, so letter A or verse 36, if you're following along in the worksheet here, you need to write this down, a message about peace with God. That's what this is all about. Does it make peace with other people? Well, yeah, if you have Jesus as your Lord, doesn't matter if you're, you're Jew, Gentile, Scythian, slave, barbarian, free. We're all going to be at peace with each other and work toward harmony with each other. We're all unified in Christ, as we'll see in this next series that starts next week. All of that is important for us as Christians, but with the world, mm, and even with members of my own family, mm, relatives at Thanksgiving, we're not at peace with all those people. We can't be if they don't see the Lordship of Christ the way that I see the Lordship of Christ, which is my life is his, he is my king, he's in charge, I do what he says. That's going to create friction and conflict. But the point is, I get peace with God. And that's the message I'm sharing with my coworker at work. That's the message I'm sharing with my neighbor. I'm sharing with someone in, who's driving the Uber and we turn to spiritual things and I feel like this is a receptive conversation. I'm going to talk to you about a message, and it's a message about you being at peace with God. Don't miss that, because there's a million synthetic, artificial substitutes for that. Do, don't you know? I mean, the, the appeal has been, hey, you want a better life? Do you need purpose? Do you need meaning? Do you feel alone? Do you need security? I mean, all kinds of things, and it's all about my life here and now, the temporal stuff, and Christ becomes this life coach. That's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is a message of reconciliation with who? First and foremost, with, to God. Matter of fact, that's the whole point of redemption. Redemption is to make you, who are at enmity with God, to be at peace with God so that God can look at me and say, hey, forgiven. No enmity, nothing separating me and you. You now become an adopted child in my family. That's the feel of the message, verse 36. That's the point of the message. Okay, now, verse 37. Are you with me here? You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, southern Israel, beginning from Galilee, northern Israel, after the baptism that John proclaimed, which, by the way, is another reminder that predicates on the fact that this is about repentance, is about Christ being Lord, doing what he says. John preached that message. Jesus even submitted to that message, interestingly enough, in doing something we're about to talk about. And how God, verse 38, anointed Jesus. That's a kind of a weird word in modern parlance, but the idea of anointing simply means the poor, and the picture of, of the Spirit of God being poured on Christ was even depicted in some kind of visual scene at his baptism where the Spirit came on him. And then from that point, and he started doing miracles. Right? All the fables of Christ doing miracles of the, as a kid are all wrong. He did no miracles as a kid. He did no miracles as a teenager. He did miracles as an adult, starting with the baptism of John when the Spirit of God came on him and then empowered him to bring natural law to show who he was, God in human form, and he went around proving that in a three and a half year public ministry. The Holy Spirit, right? Anoint, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So here's this Trinitarian discussion. God, right? This referent for the Father has his Son, who all throughout the New Testament is described as being in the, the, the exact image and representation of the Father. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? All the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Here is the Son, the Father, and the Spirit now empowering his work. And all of that Trinitarian talk focuses on the message about Jesus living here on earth, in Galilee, in Judea, doing all the ministry that he did. And it's depicted here as good. Right? What about doing good? Because, I mean, look at him. Right? God, God was with him. God the Father was on him. He and his Father were one. Everything was copacetic between he and the triune God. He was a good man. In the perfect sense, when Jesus, someone came to Jesus and said, hey, good teacher, he said, why are you calling me good? No one's good but God alone. Right? He wasn't eschewing this 
this title, he was making clear, do you understand the implications of what you just said? Absolute goodness, which of course he is. Matter of fact, he was without sin. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So we have a message right, about someone who's going to save us from our sin, but it's very important that we present him accurately. He wasn't just a decent guy or a guy who was better than the rest of us. It's put this way, verses 37 and 38 on the outline. It's a message of a perfect Savior. Now, all these subpoints right here are all for this purpose. Okay? If you said, hey, uh, Pastor Mike, um, you got kids? Tell us about your kids. And I said, yeah, uh, I got three kids. I got Matt, John, and, and Stephanie. And my wife said, did you tell them about the kids? Yeah, I just did. Matt, John, Stephanie. Okay, to say the words that represent an entire life right, is not enough. So if I say, yeah, I know the gospel, right? I know the gospel about sin, about Christ, about his deity. It's about his death, about his resurrection. You can say all that in a conversation. If you cannot explain that, if you can't make it clear what that's all about, right, then we haven't done our work. You're not prepared. You're not equipped. You have to be able to say, why is it that, that the message of the gospel resides and the spotlight shines on a perfect Savior? Why is that important? Well, the Bible talks a lot about that. It talks about the fact that his goodness was something done in humanity as a human being, fulfilling. That's why this is partly so focused on his humanity. All his human life was the good life that we should have lived. We are sinners. It's a message of salvation, being right with God. Here is Jesus that was right with God because right, he was good, perfectly good. He was righteous. He was holy. He was, as we say, perfect. Right? That's what we're talking about in holiness, perfect. Why is that important? Theologically, we sometimes call this the active obedience of Christ. Right? Um, that concept, has to be understood in your mind in some way if you're saying more than Jesus was God and Jesus was good and Jesus never sinned. So what? Right? You're sitting there talking to Cornelius. What does that matter? Right? Couldn't God just look from heaven and say, hey, you guys are forgiven? No, no. He had to send his son and you'd say, well, it's about him dying for us. Well, yeah, it's more than that. It's about him living for us. Right? It's, it's about this thing that he did in the entirety of his life from the manger to the cross, right? God did not beam his son down to earth like a Star Trek episode on Thursday to have the Last Supper and then die on Friday and get raised on Sunday. He had all these years in between, right? And those years right, were what some theologians call the preceptive righteousness of Christ, the preceptive obedience of Christ. And the reason some theologians like that phrase is because they don't like the, the, what it implies when you talk about him dying on the cross being passive. Because nothing more active than him in the garden saying, not my will, but yours be done. A sense of passivity, but he is actively engaged in dying on the cross. And he's also actively engaged for his whole childhood, his teen years, in being actively obedient and fighting temptation. Tempted in every way as we are. And his public ministry began after this great, hey, the Spirit of God is now empowering you. And he went immediately into the desert. The Spirit led him into the desert to be tempted, to be very clear in some Mag magnificent way that he has, he, he's perfect, he's God, he's divine. And why is that important? Because Jesus had to do all the things that we did not do in his humanity so that he, we can look at a guy like Cornelius or Fred or Tim or Brenda, or whoever you're sharing the gospel with, and say, everything you didn't do in high school the way you should have, matter of fact, let's talk about your junior high years, right? What you did as a boneheaded adolescent, I just want to tell you, all of those things that you need to have somehow made right before God. God has to impute this, has to credit this to you. And, and here's the thing. Jesus lived as a 13-year-old perfectly. Jesus lived as a 16-year-old morally pure. Jesus lived as a 18 and 19-year-old without any sin. And, and that I need God to be able to have some human righteousness now imputed to me. Now, I didn't make the rules, but this is the way they're described. Jesus goes to get baptized. Why would you be baptized? I mean, here is John the Baptist looking at Jesus coming to say, hey, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Here comes the perfect one. And Jesus says, baptize me, John. And he goes, oh, no, 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 you should be baptizing me, right? This is a baptism of repentance. I mean, you, don't, you haven't done anything wrong. I mean, that's the implication. And he says, permit it at this time so as to fulfill all righteousness. 
Right? I have to do it, and I have to do it right. I have to do it with the right motive. So all of those human righteous decisions can be credited to Mike Fabares and every other person that I've called to salvation, including Cornelius and Peter and everyone else that's going to get saved in this scene. Human right. Active obedience of Christ imputed to our account, I need a perfect Savior. He also needs to be divine because I need that to be credited to all those that are being saved. So that's a big calling. And the priests can't do it who are sacrificing sacrifices for their own sin as well as the sins of the people. I need a perfect Savior. And that's important that you're able at two in the morning for to wake you up tonight, right? And say, hey, wake up, wake up. Christ was perfect. Why? Right? Well, because you need to think through the perceptive, right, righteous obedience of Christ being imputed to sinners. I gotta have that. Next part, well, that's old, old school. I know that part. Look at the next part, verse 39. And we we're all witnesses of what he did, right, in the country of the Jews and Jerusalem. And they put him to death, hanging him on a tree. A tree. Now, why did he use that phrase, hanging him on a tree? Well, we know about the death of Christ. I know I got to talk about the death of Christ with non Christians. Okay, you're right. We need a message about peace with God. We need to make it clear that's the whole thrust of this message. We need a message about a perfect Savior. I need to know something about the act of obedience of Christ. We also need this message, a message of a death on a cross. But what's that death on a cross all about? Well, it's a substitutionary death. If he's perfect, right, the wages of sin is death, he should not even be dying. God should just assume him into heaven. Like the Catholics wrongly think that Mary didn't die because she was sinless, so she was just brought up into heaven because she shouldn't die. That makes perfect theological sense. It's not historically accurate, nor is it true, and it's heresy, but it makes sense. Well, why wasn't Jesus, who was actually sinless, why wasn't he just assumed into heaven? Because he was going to die. Die, why? Here's how First Peter puts it, the just, the righteous, right? That's what the word just means, for the unjust, for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. So that is a substitutionary death, and that's the message we're bringing. Verse 39, if you're taking notes, it's a message of a substitutionary death. Why the word tree and not cross? Could he use the word cross? If anyone knew about a cross, it was the Roman, right, who was out actually carrying out executions, a guy like Cornelius. He doesn't use cross, he uses a word that reminds us, now this is Greek, of course, of the Old Testament reminder that cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, it was made of wood, and it certainly stands in as a word to represent the Roman cross that was made of wood. But the point is, this is a, this is a sign of cursing. This is God's curse. Right? You, you hang a, a, a Jewish man on, on a tree and kill him, right? hang him, whatever. That is, a, that is a sign of God's displeasure and his curse and his anger toward that person. I mean, that's like the ultimate justice. Well, that picture of hanging on a tree and God's curse being upon a person, he says, well, we know that, that that's what happened to Christ. We were all witnesses to that. And that reference is a reminder that Jesus dies as though he's under the punishment of God the Father. And yet you just told me you went around doing good. The Spirit of God was on him, powerful, breaking natural law, right? In sync with God. Well, what's going on? Well, what's going on is all my sin then was placed on him. That imputation works two ways. His righteousness is imputed, credited to me. And if you're thinking, I'm getting too theological. That's not a biblical word. It is. The Greek word in the New Testament repeated over and over is logizomai. Logizomai is the idea of that we need it credited to us. Credited as righteousness. His righteousness credited to us, right? And then my sin is imputed to him on the cross. All of my sin is on him. God is treating him as though he were me as a sinner. He dies with the curse that I deserve. That's called substitutionary. That's actually called penal substitutionary atonement. Penal, it's illegal. It's the structure of God's justice. It's substitutionary. I should have been dying there. And it's also, right, an atonement or a redemption that God is now taking care of the sin problem. Think about how 2 Corinthians 5 ends, right? God made him who knew no sin good. God on him. Holy Spirit anointed him all over him. Right? This is the triune God, all in here in, in bodily form. We have this God, the Son, right, in sync with the Spirit, in sync with the Father, all of that. And yet God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us in our place. Right? He becomes the embodiment right, of what God is going to do to sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of Christ. I'm quoting now 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. That picture... 521, look it up, last verse in the chapter. That picture of substitution, right? that's the message that we bring to people. 
But I wouldn't get there, just like Peter didn't get there, until we deal with some of the big issues, like this is a message of salvation from sin, this is a message about you being reconciled to God, this is a message about a perfect Savior who lived in our place, it's about a perfect Savior now that dies in our place. He hangs on a tree. And again, this is a summary, this is a synopsis, who knows how much he went into detail on this. But I know the rest of the Bible goes into detail on this, and you ought to go into detail on this, and you ought to be able to be waking up, woken up at three in the morning and have someone say, why did Jesus die on a cross? What is that about? The curse of being hung on a tree, the picture of God, his justice being spent. And again, non-Christians, they're not prepped for any of this. They're just struggling with that idea. Right? The cosmic child abuse theory that the modern liberals and, and skinny jean preachers preach about. I'm not bad at bag in skinny jeans. <laughs> jeans can be as skinny as they want, I suppose. But my point is, I'm sorry. <laughs> they wear like ski caps when they're not skiing. Anyway, I'm, whatever. doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm an old guy. I get it. But my point is, it isn't cosmic child abuse, right? Which is a dumb way to put it. I just, I would love to rant about that, but I have no time. The point is, God the Father cannot be a just God dealing with sin unless he deals with the problem, and there has to be a payment. There's no judge that can just be called a loving, nice judge just because he releases every single criminal he sees. You can't do that. You can't even let go of criminals that you like or criminals that are related to you. All of that is egregious. It's a travesty of justice. Why the shoot 'em up movies still work, because we, we think the bad guy should be punished and the good guy should win. Well, the point of us being exonerated from our sin, it has to be dealt with, and that's what the cross is all about. God did settle the score with sin on the cross for his children, a single sacrifice that perfects us, Hebrews 10, 14 says. All right, verse 41. I'm sorry, verse 40. But God raised him on the third day. Raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Right, just to make it clear, what we're talking about this is not some metaphorical, some kind of spiritual, some kind of Gnostic raising from the dead, verse 41. Not to all the people, right? And he's not going to show up here in your house, Cornelius. It's like Thomas being chided, like, I wasn't here when he was here. I want to see him. It's like, no, you're going to have to trust the witnesses. And there were so many. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Sometimes at one time, 500 people hearing the resurrection. Right? He appeared for 40 days after his resurrection. But a certain group of people, and you have to take their word for it, who are willing to die for that truth, right? And there are many of them. Even as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he says, many of them still alive today. Go talk to them. And he ate and drank, just so you know, he's not a ghost or a phantom. He ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So here is a resurrected physical body. The body that we put in that grave is no longer there. You go in and it's not like some new thing happened in the sense that that body's there and now he's got a new body. And you sometimes talk in that shorthanded way about the resurrection. Don't talk that way, at least not in your thinking about the resurrection, right? That, that's why it's important even what we do with our bodies, even though who knows how long it's going to be from the time that you lay the body in the grave and the time that it's resurrected. God has a one-for-one -one correspondence between the body in the grave and the body that's resurrected. And that body, whatever's left of that body in that state or wherever the rest of the atomic matter is, God is going to take that, reassemble it, reconstitute it, and glorify it, it says in Romans chapter 8, and, and, and reanimate it, right? And, and do what God did to Christ. And that was something that proved that all of this worked. Remember Jesus on the cross said the word, it is finished. I say it's a word. That's a bad grammar, Pastor Mike. That's three words. It is finished is one Greek word, tetelestai, and it means, it's an accounting term among other ways it's used. It's, it's done. It's paid in full, finished. So if the wages of sin is death, and he went and said, I'm going to pay the payment of sin. I came, he said, not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a payment, a ransom for many. If he makes that payment and it's acceptable and the sin problem has been paid for, then I think the wages of sin that is death ought to be reversed and we ought to have some ratification of this thing, this whole equation, by a resurrected body. Because if you're saying if Mike Fabares dies as a sinner, he's going to be resurrected in a glorified state without reference to sin, then I want to see that as, as the ratification, the down payment, the first fruits, as it's put in 1 Corinthians 15. I ought to see that happen. I mean, that would make sense. And God says, of course, and that's what we did. That's what happened to Christ. Raised bodily, the teeth in his mouth, the tongue, the taste buds, the eyelashes, the elbows, his fingernails, all of that raised from the dead, glorified, made perfect, impervious to decay and destruction. And that is something we're holding up to people as a ratifying act. I put it this way, verses 40 and 41. We have a message of a ratifying resurrection. The resurrection was the validation. It was the thing that showed this worked. When he said it is finished, you could stand back and cross your arms and go, really? Yeah, well, three days later, you'd know it. Well, why didn't it get raised three minutes later? Because you would doubt it. 
right? You're doubting it anyway, but he let him be in You know what a dead body does? Even in the coolness of a tomb, right, for three days? I mean, think about that. On the third day, he is going to be a putrefied, rotting corpse. I don't care how many spices you put around him. You put spices in that wrapping so that he won't stink up the whole, the whole town. Well, what's the point of that? The point is that he's dead, really dead, super dead, fully dead, as Princess Bride would remind you, right? You get fully dead. And you now are seeing him rise from the dead. And when you're fully dead, your body will rise from the dead. It will be reanimated if you trust in Christ because this ratifies the whole equation. Wages of sin is death. Death has been paid for. Now we have the validation and ratification of salvation. Verse 42. Verse 42. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. Now there's some strong words and none of these really play well in the modern society. Let's start with the word that I have to say, uh, you know, every time they say, well, what do you do for a living? I preach. Oh, man. Really? Preach? Preach. Don't preach at me. Right? You're telling non-preachers to not preach at you. Preaching. Preaching. Preach. Strong word. Caruso. Proclaim. Strong. I mean, preach. I remember when I was an early Christian uh, in ministry, I, I was like, I don't want to use that word. It's kind of... Vince. Man, I'm, I'm, ask me now. I said, I'm a preacher. I preach. What does that mean? I'm declaring strongly a message that is super important for you to hear. Why? Because there's something here people don't like to hear either. He's going to judge people. Judge people. Right? Think about how much we don't even like that word. Don't judge. Let's you be judged. Jesus said that, right? Okay. No, that's not what he said in the context of what he's talking about. He says, do not judge in a measure you're not willing to be judged by. You better be very honest and fair in your judgments about things. Right? Judge with righteous judgment, he says. It's a whole other sermon. But what's the point? Here are some strong words about something that needs to be said strongly about something that has a great consequence, and that is one day you're going to stand before your maker, whether you're living or dead. Those are metaphorical, euphemistic ways to talk about the dead do not have the favor of God. They go to a particular kind of judgment. It's called the great white throne judgment. Follow me now. And the Christians, think about that. If you were raised in church, you probably never even heard a sermon on the Bema seat judgment of Christ, that every Christian will be called to account for his or her life before God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, right? Romans chapter 14, we're going to have to go and answer before the living God as a Christian, the living, or at the great white throne in judgment for the, the dead, the non-Christian. The point of us thinking about that being an urgent Reminder, we're kind of ringing a bell. This isn't like, let's just sit on a talk show and talk opinions about God. Well, I think this, I think that, whatever, you're right, I'm right, who cares, whatever. That's just what I believe, and I really believe it. That's not our message. Our message, right, versus, what is it? Uh, I already gave you the ratifying resurrection, uh, verse 42, a message of urgent necessity. That's how I put it. This is a message of urgent necessity. Preaching, judgment. Why do I want to get this to you now? Because you're going to die. I know some people that are, you know, not doing very well in their health, and they're elderly, and they're dealing with COVID and all this. And I'm like, man, we got to deal with this message again. It is appointed a man what's to die, and then you'll have a second chance. Do you know that verse? This is nine o'clock crowd. I know you know your Bible. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then comes the judgment. Right? That's it. That's it. You breathe your last on this earth. You're 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 set. You're either in Christ and in the living, and you will be evaluated for your Christian life, or you're a non-Christian, you're going to stand before God and he's going to open up the books, look at the deeds, and he's going to judge you according to what you've done. I'm just saying I'd rather be rewarded for what I've done and see some things burn up, wood, hay, and straw as a Christian at the Bema seat, and even suffer loss that I wasn't a better Christian. I'd rather have that than have my maker say, here's all the things you did, and since you weren't willing to put your trust in Christ to have him pay for it, now you have to pay for it. That is a sobering reality, and I think when you're having a conversation with someone who's starting to have ears to hear and eyes to see, ears to hear the gospel, eyes to see Christ, I better make sure that this is not a, well, this is my opinion, you think about it, whatever, you know, get back, get some books, maybe you can read. We need to lean forward in this conversation. This is an urgent conversation. This is an urgent conversation that people need to get. Think about how the scripture puts it. Today, Paul said to the Corinthians, is the day of salvation. Look, look what the writer of Hebrews says to his audience, right? Today, if you'd hear his voice, do not harden your heart as they did in the wilderness, right? Hebrews chapter three, Hebrews chapter four, he repeats that over, today, today, today. I mean, even Joshua, that picture in Joshua 24, right? Today, you gotta, today you got to choose who you're going to serve. This is a time of decision for people, right? And I know some of you high Calvinists don't like that word, but that's what this is. You're making a decision, 
I understand this is something we credit God with. It's God's work. He draws, he prepares, opens ears. But man, you better know that your volition is going to be involved in this. And you better make this decision to follow Christ. It's an urgent message, and I'm here to preach it. Because there is someone that will judge, and it's Christ. Christ will be the judge, and he knows what it is to be human. He lived as a human being, and he will be the judge of the living and the dead. Verse 43, at least the first part of verse 43. To him, Christ, all the prophets bear witness. What does that mean? They wrote it in their books of the Old Testament. Are you doing the DVR with us every morning, I hope, or nighttime or whenever you do it? Good, thank you. Um, have you been reading? Did you read yesterday and this morning? In the middle of, uh, we're two-thirds of the way through Isaiah in our Old Testament reading. And here repeatedly we have God through Isaiah disdaining those who are trusting in the false idols. And the one way, right, he says, you need to know how vain and ridiculous it is. And anyone who puts his trust in idols is an abomination to me. Why? Because they can't do anything. Today, we talk about how you cut down a tree, you make an idol, you prop it up, you take the other half of the wood and you, you burn it in the fire and warm yourself. You don't even realize how ridiculous the mute and dumb idol is. You can't trust. None of that has any sentience, let alone power. It doesn't. It's ridiculous. He said, but look at me. There is no other God besides me who can tell you what happened from the beginning, right before you're born, and can tell what is going to happen in the future. Think about this now. He says, yes, I would like the false gods to come and tell us what is going to happen in the future. Now, here's the problem with time, space, confined human beings. We can't do that, right? And there's no, you know, medium or priest of some idol that can do that. You can guess, you can be Notre Dame and talk in really weird sentences and hope that maybe some of that fits with something in the future. But you cannot be specific like we saw in the reading this morning. Did you read this morning's? At the end of that passage, we have him naming Cyrus. It's one of the reasons that liberals don't even like the book of Isaiah being a book that was written by Isaiah in the time period that Isaiah wrote it. Matter of fact, they had all these theories in the 18th century that this could not be one author, right? Because we do not believe that this guy could have said by name the coming Assyrian king when we were still in the Babylonian epic. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it doesn't make sense if you're just Isaiah kind of winging a few names and throwing them out about somebody in the future. But if this is God, and God is the author, right? And all these books are co-authored. We've got a human author and a human pen, human styles, and God putting down on paper what is his word. And he says, Cyrus is going to be, and we'll start tomorrow morning's reading with this, Cyrus, my anointed one. I'm choosing him. I'm putting, I'm sovereign. No God can do that. Right? Look in the Quran. Read the Quran. Read it, man. It's a, it's a, it's a mess, really, right? It, it is a mess, but it's certainly not filled with the predictions the kinds of predictions we have throughout the Bible. You can read the book of Deuteronomy and see that during this period in the 15th century BC, we have specific prophecies about not only Israel, this nomadic group of people that just left Egypt, one day having a king in a land, but that king and the people sinning and falling into idolatry, being taken away to a foreign country, and in that foreign country, repenting, and then coming back and being restored. The whole Babylonian captivity is spelled out in the Pentateuch. And the Pentateuch, Right? In the 15th century BC, those things didn't even happen until, until when? Well, until the 5th century BC. So we had a thousand year period between just those. There's no getting around that. I probably should have put this book on the back. I put it there before, and there are several others, and it represents a whole category of books. But Barton Payne wrote a book called The Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy. Right? We're not looking for sensational, you know, Hal Lindsey stuff where you know, the locust in Revelation or, or, or helicopters, you know, marine helicopters. That's not the point. What does the Bible say about nations, about kings, about epics, about periods, about times, about, how about, about the Messiah, about the coming of the Messiah, about where he'd be born, and what? all of that. Those are prophetic statements in the Bible, and you've got no other book. Writings of Confucius, doesn't work, right? The, 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 the Hindus, the, the Buddhists, there's no other God, and that's the point being made in our Bible reading, that can do this, but God has done it. You've got a book, and I put it this way. What did I, what did I call it? It's a message of prophetic proof. Jot that down, 43a. We have a message, and we're telling this message, not only with an urgency, but an urgency that can be backed up by the fact that this is all, in, it's all written. I was going to say encoded. It's, not, it's just there in propositional statements about what God has called from the beginning of time. Check it out. A lot of skeptics about the Bible have looked for that very thing. And then if you want to start reading people that didn't believe these things, just look at how God kind of pulled rabbits out of hats to say, you guys are ridiculous. Like 1947 and the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Of all the scrolls for them to find first, and they found a ton 
right? 38 to 39 books of the Old Testament were there along with commentaries and hymn books and all the things that they had predating Christ. By the time we were in the 19th century believing that Isaiah could not have been written by Isaiah and there were plenty of authors, at least two, we had Isaiah and Deutero-Isaiah and all this coming, what, what's the first stinking scroll to come to the Americans with a guy who has a 35 millimeter camera, right? And, and, and here he is taking pictures of the very first scroll intact, laid out. Yeah, it's got some rough wedges around the top and the bottom. It's the Isaiah scroll, all in one piece, predating Christ, which is full, by the way, not only of, of, of 100 year preceding prophecies about Assyrian kings, but what about all those things that it says about the coming of the Messiah? and the particulars of the coming of that Messiah, and his death and his resurrection, all in Isaiah. I mean, it's just God is so importantly trying to get us to think. That's why I wrote that little book called Why the Bible, which is one of many. And, and Dr. Mounts, who was here, speaking of CBI weekend, just came out with a book. He just sent me a pre-release copy of it, uh, Why I Believe the Bible. Good book. Need to get it. It's, it's just coming out. Zondervan published it. And uh, I'm just telling you, if you haven't dealt with that, as Schaefer said, that there is a God and he has spoken, right? Is the Bible his word? We got to start there. And that, I think, is a good thing for Paul to remind, I'm sorry, for Peter to remind this Roman soldier, this is something that has objective proof. Ah, Jesus isn't going to show up in your palace here or your, your digs, your, your officer's quarters in Caesarea Maritime, but you got a book, you got scrolls, you can go down to the synagogue and read that testify to who Jesus was. Not only that, but a ton of other biblical prophecies. Middle of verse 43. What did it bear witness to? Well, among other things, not only to him, but that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So you want a little inclusio here. You want the, the bookends here. We started with peace. This is a message of peace. right? So that we know this is about getting right with God. And then here's the word it ends with here. And that is forgiveness of sins. You trust in him, forgiveness of sins. Your problem with God is sin. Your problem with God is you don't measure up. Your problem with God is falling short of the glory of God. Your problem is transgression and iniquity and sin, and it needs to be forgiven or you're going to die and you're going to have to pay for all that. That's the gospel, right? And I don't care what you say. I don't care who you're listening to. If they say something else, they're not teaching what's in the Bible. The Bible says that, and you have to be forgiven. Wasn't it yesterday's morning reading in Colossians chapter 1? That beautiful line about you are qualified in him to receive a share in the inheritance of the saints of light. How good is that line, right? The forgiveness, and we ought to be giving thanks to the Father of your Christian for that. And that message, right, is what we're bringing to people. It's a message, I put it this way, 43b, of full forgiveness. This is not Catholicism. This is not some kind of works righteousness. This is not you trying to kind of measure up and then maybe going through the spiritual car wash after you die called purgatory, and maybe eventually you'll get there and join us. This is about a full qualification of forgiveness. One of my favorite passages in all the Bible, Psalm 103, it talks about my sins being removed from me as far as the east is from the west, and that's a long way. And God is saying that, here you go. My sin, bam. Still going to be judged for my behavior? Absolutely. But what does that mean? The condemnation that my sins deserve, they're as far from me as the east is from the west. Uh, no condemnation for those in Christ, Romans 8.1. So I know that the message I'm bringing you is at the end of this conversation, if you trust in Christ, your sins will be forgiven. Now, was there more to this conversation? There probably was, because look at the next verse, verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. So he's in the middle of his gospel presentation, and all of a sudden now, Something happens that happens in every converted life. The Holy Spirit invades them. That's what the Bible says. The Spirit of God then, it, he indwells us and seals us in Christ for the day of redemption. That's what the Bible teaches, right? In this case, because this was such a big deal, we had this whole Jewish contingent here watching this go down with a Roman centurion, right? God then adds a miraculous event that mirrors the miraculous event in Acts chapter 2. And now for the second time in the book of Acts, we have people speaking languages. It's almost unfortunate that we translate it tongues because you think of something you know, defined from a Pentecostal movement of people jabbering, saying things that don't mean anything. These words meant something. They were saying things in languages that they didn't learn. These Romans, these sweaty, smelly Romans with their helmet sitting on a shelf and their spear leaned behind the door in this, in this palace, they start saying things in perfect dialects and in, in languages that they didn't learn. They, look at it, the believers, verse 45, 
from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was being poured on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Right? Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized. This big sign of you are now a part of us. You are in this thing called, called Christianity. It was yet to be called Christianity. It will be soon. But the, the sect called the way. You'll be right with God. You'll be forgiven. We've got to show that through this water baptism thing that Jesus talked about. So we've got to do it. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name, the authority of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain. Of course you would. Your evangelist just shared Christ for, for some days. And so Peter stays. That section there, verses 44 and following, 44 through the end of the chapter, verse 48, um, you ought to expect to see changes in the people that get this. Okay? Now, there's some miraculous changes going on here, speaking languages they didn't learn. But number three, let's put it this way, you ought to expect God's post-conversion changes in the people that actually get this right. And there are people that like to say, well, I want the insurance policy, where do I sign? And they say, I, I, I'll, I don't want to go to hell. You're pretty convincing about that judgment stuff and death and all that. So I, what do I need to do? Pray a prayer? Okay. Is there a check I write to someone, your church? What do I do? Go to a Bible study? And they'll try to check a box. But from that point on in their life, there's no significant trajectory changes in their life. Their life goes on pretty much as it did before. Well, this is the beginning of a life change because now you have in your life the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. That's a descriptive that reminds us of what kind of spirit he is. Not only is that identifying him as the third person of the triune Godhead, but he's also a spirit that is all about holiness, doing the right thing. What are you known by? Well, whether people know it or not, socially in your life or how egregious your sins are, you're known for sin. You're a sinner. You're a compromised person. Well, the Holy Spirit now is going to live in you. Now we've got the odd couple scenario where the holy one is going to live with me and my spirit the unholy one, and he's going to get to work. It's called sanctification. He's going to set me apart increasingly in my behavior. He sets me apart judicially. That's called justification. can be under the umbrella of the word sanctification. It means I'm set apart for God, made right with God. I'm in his family, and now I start the process of sanctification. Holy Spirit's in my life. Now, there's no need for us to see this miraculous outpouring of God's Spirit that's going to manifest itself in the speaking of a language you didn't learn. Right? We can bait that, and I have it other times. I put a sermon on the back of the worksheet, even a series about what the tongues phenomenon of the modern age looks like. But I'm talking about the biblical evidence of Christianity. Today, I look throughout the, Spirit, the, the New Testament, and I see the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. I get to see all the things that God starts to work on in my life, and that trajectory change I ought to be looking for. Three things real quick. Verse 44, right? You see those subpoints there? Uh, what we're going to see, number one, is a new relationship with God. Verse 44, the Holy Spirit fell on them. Even that word, fell on them. God, God says, they, they're mine. Bam. And that picture of God now having this relationship with those people, that's what we should expect. That affects stuff like how you read your Bible, whether you want to pray or not, what you pray about. All of those things, the Bible says, begins because God has now started this personal relationship with you. And, that, and by that, I mean, it's so involved in your interior life that it's not just about you going to a church or thinking new thoughts. It's about you being driven to do something new in the way you act, the way you think, the way you value, the way you prioritize. God gives you a heart of flesh that beats in sync with God, Ezekiel 33, and not a heart of, of stone. You ought to expect that post-conversion change. Even as it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, his spirit Right? We'll bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And every Christian that sits here today, I hope you can look at that reality. When I put my trust in Christ, God had prepared me, I had ears to hear, God encountered with the gospel and the messenger of that gospel. And then from that point on, something changed in the interior of my life. I had a new relationship with God. I wanted to read his word. I wanted to pray. And now all of a sudden, I started seeing things in my life happen that gave me that assurance that I'm actually in this thing called Christianity. Verse 45 Right? Here were the circumcised. And the believers from among the circumcised, right? that's an indicator of their Jewishness. They came with their Jewish senior pastor from Jerusalem. They'd gone through Lydda and all the cities, and they came to Joppa, and now he's in Caesarea, and they're there watching their Jewish pastor right, win this Roman to Christ, and they were amazed. Why? Because they got the same gift that we got, the Spirit of of God was given to them. It was poured out on them. So we got the word fell, poured out. It is just 
as, they are just as connected with the real God as we are. Talk about a message of reconciliation. They are reconciled. And you know what that started to do? Now we talk about this, this horizontal peace, this kind of reconciliation among people that were at one time alienated from each other. Now all the Christians here start to get together. And now the Jewish Gentile thing, we had some things to iron out in terms of the proclivities and, and the, the preferences of people. And we have this thing called the Jerusalem Council coming up. But what we have starting right here is Jews going, wow, they are as in this as I am. And that then becomes something that they want to hang on to. Matter of fact, look at how it ends. The last verse of verse 48, and they asked him to remain for some days. And the Jews and the Romans sat in a place in Caesarea, and they slept on the couch, you know, and they had this, this fellowship because now this Cornelius had a new relationship with God's thing called the church. I put it that way, 45. You not only have a new relationship with God, verse 44, verse 45, you have a new relationship with the church, people of God. And I don't think there is a single person in this room, if you're genuinely a Christian, who didn't immediately say, what I need now is not only this new relationship with God that is manifesting itself in a different kind of prayer life, a different kind of worship, and a different kind of, of Bible reading, but I need the people of God in my life. And the Christians now become your family. The Christians now become your team. And we talked about that in the last sermon. I don't want to go over all that, but we no longer have that separation from those people, doesn't matter what socioeconomic background we've come from, we are in this thing together. This is our family, a new relationship with the church. So they were hearing them speaking in tongues, extolling God, and Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people and um, who received the Spirit, just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized. And as we'll read in the recapitulation, the story that gets told again here, uh, we know that they did it. It's a lot like the pre-conversion obedience. They wanted to hear. They were eager to hear. And now they're eager to obey and they get baptized. And we'll see more on that in the next chapter. But jot it down that way. There's a new kind of obedience, a transformation in the interior motives of people's hearts are changed. That is the evidence of a transformed heart. Peter said, I'm sorry, James says, how can you say you have faith, this relationship with God, I trust in God, I'm forgiven, Holy Spirit lives in me, and not have works? Right? Those works are going to be a manifestation of that. Your working out of your salvation is going to be a natural following evidence of your new relationship with God. It's good to be back at our church, and I know it pretty well, because I know on the patio, if I didn't finish the story about the Ritz-Carlton, you're going to ask me what happened. When the guy said that, I opened my folder and I found no notes in there. I had to make a quick decision. And again, I just nerve-wracking this group. I mean, people that I see on television, they're out there, you know, the Christians of, of the society, and I uh, leaned over to my handler and I said, I'll be right back. And I, you know, was right in the front row. I went down the aisle. I walked briskly trying to act like I was fine. And then I got to the door where I knew they couldn't see me. And I had my suit on, remember that? I ran, baby. From that ballroom, down the hall, into the lobby, to find the valet, to speak to him in very terse terms about my need for my car. Bordering on the violent and the, and, and the frenetic. <laughs> I need my car now. I don't care who's waiting for their car. I need my car now. Uh, I got my wallet somewhere. I, I will make this worth your while. I got it. Matter of fact, I don't even want you to get my car. Can you run to wherever my car is in some bunker, wherever it is, and let me just see if I can keep up with you? And so he has to fumble for the keys. He gets the keys, and we run. And he was young. He outran me. But I was running as best I could behind him to find where my car was. Okay, He had the key, and he opens it up. And sure enough, I go there in the back seat, and there was my briefcase which I had uh, gone through my notes and printed them out and read through them, stuck them there, grabbed my folder, right? thinking, I got to need my folder because I got to put my notes in the folder. Well, that was the step I missed. And uh, I grabbed those things, right? I uh, put them in my folder and I ran. And, and this time I, I ran faster than he did because I was heading to the lobby and down the hallway and into the ballroom. And as I'm coming in the back, they're introducing me. You've seen like the old-time heavy-set preachers in the South that come up with a hanky as they preach? <laughs> Man, I needed one of those. 
I barely got to the platform on time. And I preached. The moral of the story. If I couldn't wake you up at two in the morning and have you tell me something about the act of obedience of Christ or the substitutionary atonement of Christ or why the resurrection is important, what the message of the gospel is all about, um, if you feel like you don't have the preparation and grasp on things you need, then uh, here's the moral of the story. Run. <laughs> Get it done. When Paul wrote, uh, not Paul, the writer of Hebrews wrote, the Hebrew audience, he said, listen, by this time you ought to be teachers, but in instead you're there sucking on the bottle. You're a big baby Huey, if you know what that old reference is. You guys need to get it together. You ought to be teaching these things. You should have no need for someone to teach them to you, right? Because you've been a Christian long enough. And all I'm telling you is when you're a brand new Christian, you can give your testimony and point people to church, point people to the Bible. But many of you in this church, particularly the nine o'clock crowd, my most mature and astute crowd, don't tell them I said that at 11. They're fun at 11, but I know how smart you are. I'm just telling you this. We got to catch up, right? And the word in that passage, and I don't want to start preaching another sermon right now, and I shouldn't, but nothros in Greek, it's the word, it's just you're sluggish. Let's not be sluggish. I don't care if you're wearing a suit. Run. Get it done. Let's catch up. And if you're not a Christian, I don't know what to tell you other than I hope this sermon, you've been listening to it. You need to respond in repentance and faith. Let's pray. God, give us a uh, passion to know the gospel, to master the gospel components. Not just the words, not just in introducing our kids by saying their names, not just sharing the gospel by saying, Jesus loves you, he died for you, you're a sinner, repent. But being able to unpack that for people and explain that to people. And God, I know that means we've got to do some some thinking. We've got to do some explaining. We've got to talk to our kids about this. We've got to practice discussing what these things mean. We need to dig deeper in books that matter, not just reading about starlets in Hollywood or sports uh, stats in, in Sports Illustrated. God, help us just to dig deeper into these things that we might be ambassadors that know our King and we know His message. So prepare us this week and give us opportunities as we see those open doors of people that you have prepared for the conversation about the gospel in Jesus' name.